the buoy technology um, is sponsored by the U.S. Coast Guard, Coast Guard Auxiliary, and the Boy Scouts of America Sea Scout Program. I'll be coordinating your questions along with Peter Sargent on the live stream, and we'll answer, have time to answer any questions you may have after the presentation, but feel free to post those questions in the chat at any time. Our tech talks are held on the fourth Tuesday of each month at 2100 hours Eastern, 9 p.m. Next month's tech talk, Meteorology, focusing on hurricanes, is on February 28th. This is a reminder to everyone in our live stream audience tonight that this tech talk is being recorded and will be posted on the Sea Scout and Ox Scout YouTube channels. These tech talks are available 24 seven for free. So they make excellent training opportunities to review material that you learned tonight but also to share with your shipmates and flotilla training. So please take advantage of the Tech Talk recording. I'd like to hand it over to branch assistant, Hiram Mascabi to introduce our subject matter expert. Thank you, PJ, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mrs. Shelley Elliott. Uh, she's an engineer at the NOAA's National Data Buoy Center at the, Span, uh, the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. So Shelly, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, looking, ah, there we go. <laughs> I was looking for my slides. I haven't quite seen them yet. So I'll, I'll get started while I'm waiting on the slides to show up. Um, so I've been at the National Data Buoy Center for almost 30 years. Uh, I am an engineer. I specialize in software, though I don't tend to stay in my lane. <laughs> so I, I'm very interested in mechanical, electrical, how things work. I've learned all kinds about meteorology and science and scientific methods. Uh, I've even been to sea put instruments out to test them. Uh, it's uh, been a heck of a career and uh, I just am ever grateful for such an interesting place to work. So, sorry to sound a little nervous. I still don't see my slides. <laughs> well, Shelly, so, you should see your slide. You should yeah, see now I do. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry about the little difficulty there. Okay, if we can go to the next slide, please. All right. So, like I said, for 30 years, uh, I've been working at the National Data Buoy Center as a software engineer. I have degrees in electronics, computer science, and mathematics. Um, I have worked on almost all the systems at NDBC, doing designing, coding, testing, and documenting software. Um, the software I've written has run on large servers, desktops, and embedded systems. Embedded systems are my specialties. So in our buoys, we have what we call firmware. And it, um, the, it performs a data acquisition. So what it does is it takes data from the sensors, it packages it up and it sends it over a satellite satellite back to Stennis where we publish the data. And I'll get into that a little bit more um, later on. At this time uh, at work, my primary job function being a mature worker, <laughs> uh, I am now focusing on managing and participating in projects that benefit the systems managed by NDBC. So when you enter a career you often come with a skill set, something out of college, but where you start is never where you end up. Otherwise you would be standing still. So as you grow as a person, you grow as a team member, you learn how to, to manage information, how to, to um, take problems apart, how to do presentations. That's something that you do as you grow as an engineer. And eventually you end up managing people and things and 
and that's just the natural order of life. So when you start your career out of school or the military, which is a fine place to get your initial training, you might want to be looking down the tracks as to how to develop yourself so you end up where you want to be. Um, so, so what qualifies me to talk to you tonight is, um, number one, I'm a mom. My oldest child is 38 years old, so I've been at that a while. And I also have a son, <laughs> in addition to my 38-year-old daughter. Um, I was a scout leader for 14 years. I did Girl Scouts um, all the way through with my daughter's troop. I dabbled in Boy Scouts uh, with my son. And I have to honestly say I'm a little jealous. If uh, Sea Scouts had been on my radar, I'd have been there when I was a kid. I it just sounds like such a wonderful program. I've always loved the water. I've loved sailing and snorkeling. Um, I did a lot of scalloping as a child growing up. It's just hunting for shells. Just It was just a wonderful thing to see dolphins playing in the, um, the bow. So I'd, if I had known about Sea Scouts when I was growing up in Panama City, Florida, I'd have joined up. Um, my hobbies. Uh, a lot of hobbies come from, your hobbies when you're older, come from the things that you do in scouting. And what you're pursuing now that you really love when you're older and you have more money, <laughs> you tend to go back to. And those are the things that really bring you joy in life and you get to share with your own children. And hopefully they will be scouts too. And that, that is the cycle of life uh, in our family. Um, I get my engineering from my father. My grandfather was an electrical engineer and my father was an electrical engineer. So that was in, the project mentality was definitely born into me. I always had a project when I was a kid. Um, and then the scouting actually comes from my mom's side of the family. Um, the picture you see there, uh, that's four generations. My grandmother um, was a girl, and then she was a leader for my mother. My mother was a girl, obviously, <laughs> and a leader for me, for my troop. And then when my daughter came along, my mother and I were co-leaders together. And uh, hopefully my daughter will carry on the scouting tradition with her daughter. Um the hobbies that I've incorporated a lot came from when I was in scouting. Um, we did do some gardening. We all, you know, you always have that project where you go to the nursing home and you plant pretty flowers. So mine's a little beyond that. I, I grow as much of my own vegetables and fruit that as I can. Uh, I have chickens and I have honeybees and that, that triad there is a very harmonious thing with nature and I enjoy it a lot. Um, I camp a lot still. I don't sleep on the ground anymore. I have gone to a cot. <laughs> but um, I like to combine camping and canoeing and cooking and hanging out with my dogs all into one thing. It is the, um, the epic part of my summertime. Uh, I spend a lot of time out on the river. Um, and then... The other thing I like to do is the arts and crafts um, that go along with scouting. Um, I like, I'm now sharing that with my grandchild. And as she grows older, I, when she comes to stay with grandma during the summer, we're going to do scouts. <laughs> so that's what qualifies me to talk to you tonight about the National Data Buoy Center is I am fully 100% a scout at heart. All right, next slide please. All right, NDBC has a mission statement and it's uh, all about maritime safety. Um, we provide quality vetted uh, observations to, in the marine environment. We try to do it in a very safe and sustainable manner and to support the understanding and prediction to changes in weather, climate, oceans, and the coast. And we'll get into that in a little bit more. Next slide. 
All right, this is a picture of our building at the National Data Buoy Center located at Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. This is where they test the rocket engines. We are the only rocket engine test facility um, in the nation. So in addition to building buoys, we get to listen to the engines rock and roll. <laughs> and uh, it's quite interesting at times. Okay, pictured here, are Dr. Bill Burnett and Kathleen O'Neill. Um, Dr. Bill Burnett is our uh, director of the National Data Buoy Center. He has a PhD from Oklahoma University in meteorology. So if any of you guys are weather buffs, you know that that's a big deal and he's a smart guy. Um, he works really hard at uh, making sure that we do what we're supposed to be doing and getting the job done. Uh, Ms. Kathleen O'Neill is his deputy. She is in charge of our technical contract. Um, she keeps us rolling every day and has for over 30 years. And she has a, a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in engineering management. And we affection affectionately refer to them as mom and dad. <laughs> All right, next slide. Thank you. Uh, NDBC has a long history. It was born in 1970 at the Stennis Space Center and was under the US Coast Guard. Uh, the creation of the National Data Buoy uh, Center was in response to Camille. Hurricane Camille absolutely tore the Gulf Coast up in the Mississippi, Louisiana area. It was the baby version of Katrina, which came in 2005. Um, the Buoy Center was the first federal agency to join NASA at Stennis. Uh, and that was right before the Navy joined. Um, later, it was moved for, out from under the U.S. Coast Guard and became part of NOAA and the National Weather Service. Um, I don't know who made that decision, but uh, we still rely very heavily on the U.S. Coast Guard to help us service our bu buoys. We ride their ships and um, they're an indispensable part of everyday life and planning for us. And we always have a batch of those guys working with us. Um, if you notice the big buoy, 42001, that's a 12 meter buoy. And when we first got started, we really thought bigger was better. And we found out that these really big, huge buoys and big storms flip over. Amazingly enough, then we went and we tried something that was more boat shaped. And that worked fairly well. And um, it had its advantages of pointing, you know, being able to point into the wind. And from there, we moved to various sizes of, of approximately three meters. And that was our standard for a very long time for buoys. And we still put out some of these three meters basically because we own them. And they're big enough to put some of our equipment on. Our most recent advance, we went to what's called a 2.1 meter buoy, and that's the one all the way on the right uh, with our latest payload on it. So you can see in, a, in the time that I've been there, even we were still putting a few of the 12 meters out. We've made a tremendous uh, size difference. We, we have gone down to almost what we would call a miniature buoy, and you would be absolutely amazed how much better a cork does in the, in really rough ocean. So we've learned a lot over the years and this is where we're at. All right, next slide. Thank you. Um, we actually have four different observation arrays. Um, we have 106 weather buoys and those are the little yellow, uh, I believe they're triangles and 43 weather stations. Those are actually uh, land or near land uh, coastal stations um, that capture the inland climate there just off, just off of the coast. Uh, we have 55 climate arrays. Those are the blue squares. 
uh, along the equatorial Pacific. And then we have 39 tsunami buoys and they detect um, <clears throat> the potential for a tsunami. All right, next slide. Okay, the types of data products. Um, we always have to have something we have to deliver for all the work we do. Um, we have a fantastic website. I highly encourage you to go out there and look and see what's around where uh, you like to sail. Um, you can look at sea state, you can look at wind speed, direction, all kinds of information, barometric pressure, and see if it's a good time for you to go out. Um, our data is released real time. And we say real time because it's as fast as we can get it back. Um, from the time we take an observation, we package it up, we send it through an Iridium satellite in general. We also use GOES, but I'll show you that in a second. Um, and it comes back, it gets decoded and gets packaged up and sent back out on a global telecommunication system is about 15 minutes. So that's about as fast as we've been able to get. Um, the GTS is uh, pretty interesting. If you're into science, um, at particularly meteorology or oceanographic data, this was the system that was set up to provide exchange of this real-time data. It was established by the World Meteorological Organization in 1951, and it is still as critical as it can be for ingest into all kinds of modeling and forecasting systems all over the world. Um, our third type of product is an archive project product. Every bit of data that we take in, we go back and we provide a monthly archive for um, after we do some very serious quality control on it and add metadata, which metadata is data that's about data, like, you know, what kind of sensor, when it was taken, what was the GPS location, all kinds of information that goes on um, <clears throat> about a piece of data. And we package those up and we give those to NCEI that does uh, all kinds of data archives for um, all kinds of agencies. But anyway, that's our, end, our final end product. Next slide. All right, I want to talk to you a little bit about data flow. How, how do we get the data back? So we have satellite transmitters. And depending on um, which array that a buoy belongs to is exactly which path it takes back. But in general, we have um, the DOD, Department of Defense, short burst data, uh, Iridium uh, satellites. And then for DART, we use a commercial Rudix, which is also an Iridium satellite. And DART is our tsunami data. And then our Seaman, which is our most um, aged P, uh, data system, is still using GOES. And uh, when you, GOES is the National Weather Service satellites out of Nestus. So we're still using GOES to get our Seaman data back and that should be soon converted to uh, probably Iridium. We're looking into our options. Um, we also ingest partner data and help them get to the GTS. So we do a heavy lift, not just for our own data buoy data. We do other people's too. Okay. If you go to the next slide, please. I thought you might find it interesting to see the picture of the entire buoy. So I want to talk a little bit about the data transmission. Um, for our DART system, which is our tsunami system, the smarts are actually in the bottom pressure recorder that sits on the uh, ocean bottom and measures uh, head height in millimeters. It has mathematical algorithms internal to it, so it doesn't worry about waves. It is able to filter that out and it sees the tsunami signature frequency as a tsunami would go by. 
occasionally there's mistakes and they have false events and the tsunami warning centers in Hawaii and Alaska have the ability to know the difference. Now, you may or may not know that there are two types of tsunami generating events. Um, we have the typical plate tectonics, uh, slip strike type zones. Um, those can generate a tsunami. The other thing that can generate a tsunami is a huge landslide. So when you think about tsunamis, we think a lot about like the West Pacific, but when we talk about landslides, we're talking about Alaska, those areas, and they can displace a lot of water, which creates a tsunami. Um, so what we do with the data when it's uh, is detected that there is a potential for a tsunami, that data is transmitted to the surface buoy, the surface, surface buoy, then relays it to the iridium satellite, and then it's off for processing and dissemination to the tsunami warning centers. Um, very interesting moorings. Um, I like moorings. Like I said, I dabble a little bit in the mechanical part because I, I like it. Um, we actually use huge railroad type wheels as anchors um, for some of our systems. And for other our systems, we use stuff that's called a rock. It's 2,500 pound square piece of concrete <laughs> that we anchor the, our buoys to the um, ocean floor with. And you see on the right side, that is an NDBC scoop payload. That is our latest um, meteorological and oceanographic uh, data acquisition system. And we, um, we use both Rudix and short burst for that iridium. And the Rudix is for camera pictures. So if you go out to some of our scoop buoys, you will see that we have six panes of data showing you the pictures that the buoy is actually seeing, which can be quite fascinating. Um, we found that there were birds in the center of a hurricane this year. <laughs> they were trapped and we caught pictures of them. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. Um, and once again, it's, it's a, a system that transmits and we transmit on a regular basis. Uh, like our meteorological buoys, we transmit our data every 10 minutes. So we get it back pretty fast and get it out pretty fast. All right, uh, next slide. All right, I wanted to show you the uh, weather buoys. This is another one that's a, it's a three meter foam and it has seal cages on it. We have problems on the West Coast <laughs> where seals like to get on our buoys. So we created cages where they couldn't get on there. Um, and you'll see that we have um, solar panels that keep our batteries charged so we can keep going. Um, we don't rely on just batteries. We actually have a charging system to keep our batteries charged. So it's kind of, kind of like uh, plugging your cell phone into the sun. Okay, and you can see that we have um, tons of buoys all around the continental United States, around Hawaii, um, along the Alaskan coast. And then we uh, also serve at the Great Lakes. Um, during the, uh, during the winter time in the Great Lakes, because it's fresh water, it freezes readily and we have to pull them out before the lakes freeze over. And when they thaw back out, we go put our buoys back out. So we pull them out once a year, and put them back. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so the analog to um, the weather buoy system is a coastal marine automated network we call Seaman. And like I said, these are right on the coast. Some of them are actually in the water or on little islands or up on a sand dune. Um, I gave you four examples here. We have Rock of Ages. Um, there's one on the sand dune. It's, uh, it's probably Newport Beach in Oregon. Uh, we have one off the Keys. And I think that may be Sand Key or Long Key that's standing out in the water on the, um, on the right. And we have a very famous one, um, 
Thomas Point Light that's uh, right there in the D.C. area across from Annapolis. Um, like I said, this is our oldest network, and we're working on uh, revamping it right now and bringing it up to snuff. All right, next slide. Okay. What we call our Tau network, um, the Tropical Atmospheric Ocean or climate array is another thing that we call it. We're concerned with our client, our climate. <laughs> and these buoys uh, measure uh, meteorological data and a tremendous amount of underwater data. We look at currents, we look at temperature at all different depths. And its purpose is, um, is for El Nino and La Nina prediction. So what we're trying to do is predict what the weather is going to be like when they say uh, long-term prediction that your winter is going to be cold and wet or dry and cold or the West Coast is going to get a lot of fire weather in the summer or the deluges that they're getting from the atmospheric um, rivers. So a lot of this the, the data that's fed into the models on the client on the climate and what's happening on the on the equatorial Pacific tells us what's going to happen. So that's its purpose. And uh, we do a lot of experiments in that array. It's uh, <clears throat> I would say it's probably our newest one. Uh, Tau and Dart are very were developed around the same time, and I think Tau's the newest, and we're in the middle of refreshing it too. All right, next slide. All right, our fourth array. Um, the Deep Ocean Assessment and Reporting of Tsunami at start. We have 39 of these, and as you can see, they are around the ring of fire, and we also have um, a few off on the east coast, but the biggest danger is on, on the west. As you can see, there's the bottom pressure recorder that's on a sled. We actually um, anchor that to the bottom. We have an acoustic release, so it'll pop back up when we uh, come to recover the buoy. And then the buoy is on a separate mooring that's almost on top of the sled, which is a whole trick in itself, <laughs> is to be able to drop two pieces of equipment and for them to align magically and be able to report. All right, next slide. Okay, so you may ask, so how do we get to all these buoys? Um, so for the buoys, we use a commercial vessel called the, um, the Bluefin. And you can see very vaguely our yellow buoys sitting on, on the, <clears throat> the deck. It has a crane and it has an A-frame in the back and I have a movie for you that we're gonna watch in a little while that, um, that shows night ops on the bluefin. So it works a little differently than a Coast Guard vessel. Um, the Coast Guard vessels that you're looking at are all buoy tenders. They're either 185 feet long or 225 feet long. The... Um, the sycamore <clears throat> is, if it's a tree, it's 185 <laughs> feet long. Uh, this, this is a Coast Guard tradition. I don't know exactly where it comes from, the naming convention. So I want to say, no, the sycamore is the 225. And if you see the little slot on the side, you can see that there's a crane. And then that slot allows them to sling the buoy over the edge very gently set it in the water. Um, the Marcus Hanna and the George Cobb, those are named after lighthouse keepers. That, that is a, a fine tradition. Those are the 185s um, of the uh, U.S. Coast Guard. So if you see a boat with a name like that, then you know they were a lighthouse keeper. Um, we also use Coast Guard helicopters some of our uh, seaman sites, that's the only way we can get there is we use the Coast Guard, Coast Guard helicopters and they lower our guys down in, the, in um, <clears throat> baskets with their equipment 
allow them to service our station, and then they pick them back up. Uh, in this picture, they're actually manipulating, and I think they're setting down uh, a damaged buoy that they had recovered for us, so we can come and get it. All right, next slide. All right, a little bit of a question break here. I found this picture on the internet. Um, and if you remember from a few slides back, I talked about this particular uh, seaman station, but I'm not sure who these scouts are. I was wondering if anybody out there recognized them. This is a uh, Thomas Point Light, uh, just um, across from Annapolis. All right, I'll give everybody a second. No comments so far. No comments so far? All right. <clears throat> so that's a very famous lighthouse. <laughs> it's, it's really neat, too. They, keep, they take good care of it. Uh, if you're in that area, you can actually uh, tie up to it and get out and take a tour. All right. So next slide. All right. So one thing I wanted to share um, with you is the world of work. So you think about the National Data Buoy Center and you think about guys that go out in the field and maybe you're aware that there's engineers, but there's really, and scientists, but there's a whole lot more people. We have about 200 people who keep all of this running on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we need everybody from accountants, people who run our warehouse, who drive forklifts, uh, run milling machines. We have electronic techs. We have mechanical techs. Um, the guys that go to sea. We have software engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. We have um, software programmers. We have IT guys that keep the machines running, all of the servers and the uh, network. Uh, each of us have some kind of computer system, a laptop or a desktop, and our IT people have to keep a good eye on that and keep it running. So we have tremendous number of people. We have accountants, we have buyers, we have data analysts, we have scientists. Um, we have both meteorological scientists and we have oceanographic scientists. Then on top of all that, we have managers and we have lots of managers who manage people and manage stuff. So that gives you just a little idea of all the people that work there. And I want to go, I want to go through and show you each area and the type of people who work in that area. Um, some people have, um, master's degrees, a couple people have doctorate degrees. We have a lot of bachelor's degrees from universities, um, from community colleges. We have people with associate's degrees and we have people who are just smart, got lucky and have worked their way up. So um, they knew a lot from someplace, maybe a previous job. Um, I find that we hire a lot of people who have been trained in the military, whether it was Air Force or Navy or Coast Guard, um, the military spends a tremendous amount of time moving things around and they need warehouse workers and they need people to buy stuff and they need people to track stuff in databases, uh, do logistics. Um, they have, they train their own meteorologists, they train their own technicians. So we have a tendency to pick up a lot of these guys uh, coming out of the military and not only do they have the education, they have the experience. So um, if you wonder where everybody goes after the military, well, we're one of those places. All right, next slide. All right, um, engineering. Uh, Builds the payloads, designs them, writes the firmware that go in. And when I say a payload, I'm talking about the data acquisition system that actually 
takes the data from the sensors, formats it, packages it up, and sends it over the satellite, satellite back for processing and dissemination to the public. Uh, they also test everything. They test all the sensors. And if you notice in the upper left corner, there's these little bitty green tags. And that's what we refer to making sure everything work as green tagging a piece of equipment. Um, engineers worry about um, how the buoy rides in the water because we have, we measure waves and the response of the actual platform that the um, data acquisition systems riding on the buoy itself has a different response to the wave. So we have to know what that response is to properly process and tell you uh, what the wave frequency is, how high they are. Um, if you look during a hurricane that goes over our buoys, we'll tell you exactly how high it was and how low the pressure was. <laughs> We're very good at hurricane measurements. Um, we have 3D printers. Uh, some of the other stuff we worry about, we worry about power. We have to make sure that our batteries can adequately uh, provide power um, regardless of where they're at. We can't totally rely on sunlight and we can't totally rely on batteries. So we have to have some kind of combination. And we have electrical engineers whose sole focus is to make sure that our systems are powered properly. Um, we have mechanical engineers who create the packages that these things go in. Um, they worry about tying them to the bottom, moorings. Moorings is an incredible field on its own. It is fascinating. Um, our moorings are not all chain. They're not all rope. There's a combination. We hang instruments um, underneath our buoys on the moorings. So that's a challenge. They have to know how many floats. They have to know how long the mooring can be. Um, we talked about the DART system, how we put the uh, bottom pressure recorder on the bottom, and then we have to moor the buoy almost directly over it. And so the mooring is very, what we call taunt. It's tight, very tight. And um, so we have to be very careful about that, what, what the length is, how we tie it to the bottom. So there's a lot of aspects of engineering. Um, and engineers do a tremendous amount of work to make sure that what we put in the water is one, deployable, Two, will stay there and last. And three, will provide good quality data. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's where it starts. So somebody says, we need to take a measurement. It's going to start in engineering. And it's going to be a lot of people providing a lot of input to make sure that the right data gets to the right people at the right time. All right, next slide. Thank you. Okay, so after engineering's done its job, now comes operations. This is the group that I work in. Um, operations uh, consists of a lot of technicians. <laughs> Our technicians take the individual green tag components that engineering provides, puts them together, and we do what we call a blue tag test. We make sure that all the sensors and the battery systems and the, the solar panels, everything works together. And if something doesn't work, we swap it out. So, and then they undergo a burn-in test called a blue tag. And then that system is glued together for deployment. Um, they also get all the yellow holes all ready to go. Uh, we have welders, we have um, machinists, we, we have guys that operate the water jet, the CNC machine. So um, we also have a 3D printer and a, um, 
ejection molding machine. So we do a lot of manufacturing uh, right where we're at. So we, we actually call ourselves the buoy factory. Um, we have people who, who take care of making sure that all of this equipment gets packed up properly. Um, and you'll see some pictures here in a minute of what it looks like once they get all packed up. But they make sure that that gets on a truck. So they have to order the truck to come pick it up. The truck has to take it to the port where we want it on time to be loaded on the ship. Uh, we also end up shipping stuff all over the world, too, at times. Guam is a common port that we use. Um, and then we have to keep track of who's where. So we ship guys. <laughs> we have to make sure we have hotel rooms and berthing on ships and plane flights. And we know who's going to be out there and what they're going to be doing on what day and when they're coming back and when the next crew is going to be there. So there's a lot of coordination and scheduling that goes on and people who have to keep track of it, decisions need to be made. And often those decisions have to be done uh, on the spot. So they have to be very experienced and have uh, good judgment. Uh, we, we do the most planning we can, but we do know how to adjust our sales. Okay, so next slide. Okay, I have a little movie for you. Um, we're going to need to mute the movie once it starts. It's got some really industrial sounds that are kind of irritating. Uh, but this is a night ops on our bluefin. Okay, we are 24-7, seven, seven days a week. All right, so we're putting out a scoop, the payload, a three meter. The scoop payload, if you remember, is a weather buoy. If you'll notice, they've actually got more than one buoy on the deck, and they're putting this one in the water, and you could see the wash onto the deck. And they're actually slowly putting it out into the water. And you'll start to see the surf. If you see the mooring is actually all what would they call faked out on the deck. It's laid out so it will go into the water very predictably. And if you look on the right, you can see the rock. That's a 2,500 pound piece of concrete. There we go, she's in the water. And we know that one's a West Coast buoy because it's got a seal cage on it. The nylon goes out first. And then the chain will be last. So when our guys go out on ships, they don't just work during the day. They work when they get there. It's very location dependent. And if you were working on this deck, you notice these guys are always stepping clear of the chain. And uh, all right. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. That was a little short clip. All right, next slide. All right.
right, I thought I'd give a, another little question break, see if anybody had any questions while I'm waiting. I thought I'd give you a little history. <laughs> um, I love this saying, scout me in. That is just a phenomenal saying. Be prepared as all scouts. A um, little history that um, Sea Scouts came about in Glidewell Park, United Kingdom on July 1909. And it was Warrington Baden Powell, brother of Robert Baden Powell, who came up with the Sea Scouts. Um, Robert Baden Powell, also known as Lord Baden Powell, founded Boy Scouts. And he had a friend <laughs> named Juliet Lowe who founded Girl Scouts shortly after Boy Scouts. So we're all, it's all a big family affair here, I think. Um, and I think that many, many of us have benefited from scouting. Um, so, and I found this picture of um, Walt Disney's Donald Duck Sea Scouts. So I thought you guys would appreciate. Um, this came about as a radio show in 1939. So tremendous history with Sea Scouts here. And uh, I, it's really an honor to be able to talk to you guys about the National Data Buoy Center. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, so if there are any more questions from the live stream, uh, Peter Sargent will filter those over. Um, one interesting thing about the West Coast buoys with the uh, seal cages, um, just thinking about, you know, animals obviously could could damage the buoys as they, as seals might like to ride the buoys or things like that. Um, how about birds? Do you get significant buoy damage from birds? And, you know, what can you yeah. do about it? You know, what, you know, these, these uh, challenges from the wildlife. Um, I, our biggest problem with birds is fouling up our solar panels. The, the best we can hope for is some big waves or some uh, nice rain. <laughs> Uh, we do, we do have birds do an interesting challenge. Um, actually when I, the last time I went to see, we were jumping those big 12 meters and they have like a catch bar because it's so slick when you jump on the buoy because of the birds that you're kind of sliding through all that. So it's a little bit of a job hazard <laughs> and you have to catch the bar so you can, um, not slide off the other side. Um, but yes, birds are a challenge. Um, I think people are the biggest challenge. Uh, we have in our tower array on the western side, we have a lot of problems with uh, fishermen mm. slingshotting our buoys. So when, when you have a buoy, you have a little island that creates a little bit of shade and attracts um, fish. And they begin, you know, they create an ecosystem really fast. You have algae and all kinds of things going on. Well, fishermen know this. So they tie off our, to our buoy and they pull it as tight as they can and they let it go in a slingshot effect and they scoop up the fish. So our response was to put some cameras on our buoys. Wow. So then they started putting bags over our cameras. <laughs> So it's, it's a constant thing. Uh, we've tried signs, we've tried sounds, and we just, you begin to accept a certain amount of loss. Um, we've had uh, big cargo ships just flat run over our buoys. So that kind of thing happens. Uh, we had a guy, uh, a guy, I say a guy, I guess it could have been a girl. Somebody decided to shoot one of our buoys um, on the west coast and what they didn't understand is we had lead acid batteries in there and sometimes uh hydrogen gas builds up and it was an explosion Great. so it was pretty bad <laughs> so um so it, it's nice to to use the buoy data but don't use the buoy <laughs> leave that there for all of us so it, like i said it's a little bit of a challenge uh, oh. I'd, I'd expect the the boat to buoy or ship to buoy contact, but you know some of those 
other cases, never expected me to hear about vandalism to buoys at sea. That is, it's incredible. It happens. It happens. We've actually had our buoys stripped for their parts, you know, solar panels. And, you know, if people can get out to them and they're desperate enough and they can, you know, solar panels are not cheap. So, you know, and then they can go and have, you know, hot water or TV or something. So this it's uh it's it's part of doing business for us, honestly. We we try very hard to uh keep up with the vandalism, but you can only do so much. Wow. So Shelly, it looks like there was a response to your question about which Sea Scout ship that was. And yes. Ship nineteen fifty nine. And it's sponsored by, let me get back to it. Um, Is that, that the ship out of Annapolis? Yeah, sponsored by uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary Flotilla. Flotilla. That's awesome. Good. I'm glad somebody recognized it. I thought it looked like a happy group of people. What an outstanding tie-in. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't have asked for it if you tried. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. And the Thomas Point Light is an iconic fixture um, in the Annapolis area, in the Central Maryland Bay, in the Chesapeake. No deal. Well, I highly encourage you, if you're there, go out, take a tour, and go, I know whose anemometers those are. <laughs> <laughs> Ours are there. Okay. Are there any more questions from the live stream? No other comments okay. that I can see. All right. All right. Well, then I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Shelly. I'm for, not done. For, I'm not, oh, oh I'm excellent. <laughs> oh, okay. Question break. Go for it. Okay. okay. I got a little more of the world of work to talk about. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> I won't run over. I promise. Okay. So I don't quite see my slides yet but I know what they are. Yeah. Um, so the next thing that happens after we uh, put the buoys out to sea is we get data back. And this data is meteorological or oceanographic in, um, in nature, either above the water or below the water. And we have scientists who um, keep up with the data. They analyze it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they also analyze our testing. You can see there in the middle that we're actually doing a drop test on a buoy. We want to know what happens when that buoy gets dropped in the water because it's, it's a shock to the system. Um, the Mission Control Center is 24-7, and they keep an eye on every single one of our systems. They keep an eye on every system that's in test. They analyze the data from tests. Uh, we ask them to do special stuff all the time, and um, they're meteorologists and oceanographers and mathematicians who do this for us, and we really appreciate it because without them, we would not have the quality data that we have. Uh, the scientists also give us our science requirements for engineering, so we, engineering has to pick sensors and hardware that's capable of giving the quality of it, um, data that we need for our customers. Okay. Um, next. All right. Nobody can do anything about our IT guys, right? So we have uh, programmers. We have IT specialists who manage equipment. Um, the gentleman in the middle is a senior systems administrator. He is responsible for um, our big uh, mainframe type computers. Then we have our security officer. Um, she, <laughs> security in the IT world is tremendous. And if you are interested in that kind of thing, there are a hundred jobs waiting for one person out there. You can pick and choose where you want to go because it's not an easy thing. Every one of our systems, hardware and software wise has to be secure. And then um, once again, we have people who monitor our assets. This is Chris in the upper right corner. 
he uh, he is our vandalism expert, and he analyzes when things go wrong. Was it vandalism? Was it a failure of the equipment? Um, so he can figure out what's going on. These, uh, the young lady, um, our IT specialist in the red shirt, uh, Cynthia said that she wanted me to make sure that I mentioned that she came into the government. She's an actual government employee. She's not a contractor, but a government employee who came to us through an internship called Pathways. That's a government internship program. And when you finish your internship, you are converted non-competitively to a government position. She wanted to make sure that everyone knew that that was available. Um, there are tons of internships out there. So um, there are some that are actually for people who have gradu just graduated from high school all the way to recent graduates from college. So generally an IT person has a bachelor's degree. So bachelors or masters. Um, if you're interested in management, there are uh, IT management specialties. So this is just a whole wide open world for IT and they're everywhere and we need them. All right, so next slide. Hmm. This is not good. Lost my okay. mouse. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. They are some good looking people in IT. There we go. Oops. Oh, I go. Right. Yeah, one more. Okay. So if we're going to do all of this, we have to buy stuff, we have to store it, and we have to track it. And these people are just tremendous. Um, buying anything is not easy. You have to justify it. You have to have the funds for it. You can't buy stuff you don't have money for, and you bet they will better pay your bills. So we have accountants. We have logistics specialists. Um, we have buyers. We have schedulers. We have all kinds of people who work strictly in the procurement and logistics area because we require a tremendous amount of equipment. We ship it all over the world, and it has to get there on time and in one piece. And you can see this is how we haul our stuff now. We put them on flatbed trucks, we tie them down, and those guys drive all across the United States to get to a port. Sometimes they're taken off of one truck, they're put onto a ship just to arrive at another port for us to pick up. So this is uh, another avenue. We pick up a lot of people out of the military when it comes to procurement and log logistics. Um, and if that kind of thing interests you, um, yeah, military may be a way to go. And there's also um, bachelor's degrees in uh, all kinds of management. So it's something to think about. All right, next slide. All right, there's our famous picture of Bowie Row, <laughs> which uh, we all like. <laughs> That's uh, at Stennis Space Center. We're getting everything ready to go. Um, so I appreciate everyone uh, coming and listening to what I had to say about the National Data Buoy Center. Much appreciate it, and uh, I very much appreciate the scouts, and I hope you've gotten something out of this to help you pursue your scouting. Well, on behalf of everyone tuning in tonight and for the folks will, that will be using this recording as training, I want to give a big thank you to Shelly Elliott uh, for such a comprehensive presentation uh, and teaching us about the National Data Buoy Center and what you do and the kind of data and how it's transmitted and how we can use it. Fantastic. I hope to see and hear from everyone um, at our next tech talk um, regarding hurricanes and the meteorology of hurricanes um, in February. That'll be February 28th at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Have a good night, everyone, and we hope to catch you next month.